So the civil rights movement was a movement that was fighting for greater equality, particularly for African Americans, but was one that uh, re, you know, achieved important political victories and important legislat legislative victories, but never was able to engage the economic inequality in the way that uh, I think Dr. King and most of the civil rights leaders of the late 60s understood was the uh, kind of central component of racial inequality. And so with that, yes, we have greater voting rights, yes, uh, you know, outright segregation is illegal, but the bridging of the racial income divide and wealth divide are things that uh, enough investment, enough energy was never uh, put into to bridge those important things. So that's left us with ongoing uh, racial economic inequality. And in fact, we've actually had growing uh, economic inequality as a whole, which I think has even slowed some of the progress that could have occurred. Well, I think you have to look at what are the advancements in banking and who are they going out to. I mean, I think the quote unquote advancements of, ban of banking, you know, and I think it is great that you, with the internet and with our mobile devices, you can do a lot more banking services, but the actual uh, finance, uh, the kind of services that uh, I think moderate income, lower income people still could use and be very helpful to them. That has not been a place where major banking uh, corporations have focused on strengthening their outreach. They actually realize they can make greater profits by focusing on higher income, wealthier Americans, which of course disproportionately leave out people of color. One thing is not to confuse uh, the challenge of finding financial products for moderate income people with the challenge that moderate income people have in paying their own bills. Because a new type of credit card is not gonna make your $30,000 a year job be able to afford rent, uh, daycare, and provide for your family. And I think there's too often a confusion of, well, all, the, all people need are greater financial products. No people need a greater living wage. People need universal health care. People need a strong uh, education system, actually, you know, universal pre-K, daycare. So we have to divide those two things. And then as it relates to financial services, again, I think uh, more and more of the traditional banking industry that used to be focused on an American middle class is focused much more on American upper class that has left moderate income people more to uh, payday lenders, check cashers who are providing services, but services at high cost for communities who have, oftentimes don't even have enough money to get by on. Gentrification is, you know, continues the segregation of the past. You know, I was saying that there is no outright segregation, meaning there's no signs, blacks and whites, but you see that cities have become, many cities have become more and more segregated over the last 10, sometimes 20 years. Um, and that you know, America as a whole is still a very segregated place and that is, uh, done through economics and gentrification. It's kind of amazing what you're having seeing in cities across the country is that cities were places of economic opportunity and that's why you had people of color, particularly African Americans coming in the 30s and 40s for manufacturing opportunities. Those manufacturing opportunities went into decline since the late 60s and then they became the inner city places where people who had gone for economic opportunity were now trapped. Now they are being pushed out of the inner city, people realizing there's still great locations, and we're seeing that the urban poor are being moved out and I think have increasingly become the suburban poor. So uh, a great concern about gentrification is that it doesn't, it improves neighborhoods, but it doesn't improve the lives of the people who used to be in those neighborhoods, and it just continues the inequality of the past.